So th thank you, uh, Greg, and uh, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for asking me to give this talk. And uh, you guys all win the gold medal for staying to the very last session. So congratulations to you as well. And I'm going to focus really on chronic pancreatitis since that is where surgery really is a big aspect of treatment of care. And we can certainly talk about acute pancreatitis issues in the panel session. Um, this is my disclosure slide. So chronic pancreatitis, as everyone knows, is characterized by uh, patients who develop um, recurrent or persistent abdominal pain, um, secondary to irreversible changes in the pancreas parenchyma. And eventually, these patients develop both exocrine and endocrine insufficiency. Uh, pathologically, this is characterized with ACEN or loss, fibrosis, calcification, and stricturing, as can be seen on the h &E slide on the right compared to a normal h &E on the left. Now, in North America, the two biggest causes of chronic pancreatitis is alcohol uh, and smoking. Smoking is almost always overlooked as a cause of chronic pancreatitis, but in two prospective studies have been shown to be either one or two in terms of, the, of cause of chronic pancreatitis. Other causes include gallstone disease, genetic causes, cystic fibrosis, hyperlipidemia, hypercalcemia from uh, various different causes, uh, and multiple other causes as well, but really alcohol and smoking are the two predominant causes in both North America and Europe. Now, most patients are initially managed medically with the judicious use of narcotics. Of course, if alcohol is a cause of their pancreatitis, abstinence from alcohol can relieve abdominal pain in a subset of patients. Some patients may benefit from nerve blocks, enzyme replacement, and octreotide therapy. A subset of patients may benefit from endoscopic management, including sphincterotomy, duct uh, stenting for strictures, and lithotripsy. But almost always, about 30 to 50% of patients require some form of surgical decompression or resection procedure. So what are the indications to operate in someone with chronic pancreatitis? The overwhelming number one cause of need for surgery is incapacitating abdominal pain that's refractory to medical management, refractory to high-dose narcotics, uh, and altered quality of life. There are other indications for, in, uh, for operative intervention, including complications related to the disease like biliary obstruction, GI obstruction, uh, pseudocyst formation, fistula formation, bleeding. And another cause is a subset of patients usually require operative intervention to differentiate from whether or not a malignancy is, is, is existing. Now, when we talk about surgery, we really talk about two different broad categories, resection and drainage. <clears throat> there are other operations like management of pseudocysts, sphincteroplasties, bypass, and we'll not talk about those. But really, under resection category, the operations that we often perform include pancreatic duodenectomy, subtotal pancreatectomy, and then there's a category called duodenal sparing head resections, which is much more popular in Europe, but gaining in popularity in North America. And a very select group of patients may be candidates for total pancreatectomy with autologous islet cell transplant. And deranged procedures include Pusteaux, Duval's, and Fry's. Now, with regards to uh, um, when we consider surgery, the data that we usually want to know about include the symptoms the patients are having, history of narcotic use, whether or not they have exocrine or endocrine insufficiency, other comorbidities that may exist, prior surgical history. But really, the most important thing we want to know in terms of planning surgery is the anatomy. And when we talk about anatomy, we're talking about both parenchymal anatomy and ductal anatomy. And based that on multiple different studies that we often obtain prior to surgery, including CT scan, ERCPs, endoscopic ultrasounds, and uh, MRCPs. And not, uh, not all of them are required, but a combination of them that define the parenchymal anatomy and define the ductal anatomy. So here's a patient with head predominant chronic pancreatitis, as can be seen on the CT on the right. Now, in North America, the most common operation for this patient uh, would be a Whipple operation, a pancreatic or duodenectomy, where the head uh, of the gland is removed along with the entire duodenum. Now, this operation has been looked at in multiple series in terms of its effectiveness in relieving abdominal pain, and, and you can see that uh, it relieves abdominal pain in about 80 to 90 percent of patients with long durability. Now, in North America, there's a, in Europe rather, there's a, a, um, a group of operations that are termed duodenal sparing head resection, including the Baker procedure, the burn modification of the Baker procedure, and the Fry procedure. 
So the Baker procedure, uh, described by Hans Baker, a German surgeon, really removes the head of the pancreas without removing a, a, a rim of pancreas along the C loop of the duodenum. This is then reconstructed with a single rule limb to both the left pancreas and the remnant gland along the duodenum. Now the burn modification described by the surgeons in Bern, Switzerland, really kind of just cores out the pancreas without fully dividing the neck. So if you imagine holding an apple in your hand and kind of coring out the center of the apple, that's what is done in a burn procedure. This operation can also be utilized to decompress the bile duct. And then a single rim uh, loop of a small intestine is brought up as a single uh, uh, anastomosis to the defect. A subset of patients not only have head predominant disease, but also may have uh, upstream dilation and strictures of the gland as seen by the CT and the ERCP here. And for this, uh, the most common procedure performed is a fry procedure where you core out the head like in a, in a burn procedure, but also perform a lateral pancreatogenostomy and then do a single uh, reconstruction loop to the entire pancreas. This was described by Charles Fry. Um, and uh, these procedures have been compared to each other in prospective studies comparing the Whipple to the Baker, pylorus preserving Whipple to the Baker, the Baker to the Fry, and so forth. And all of them are basically equivalent, relieving abdominal pain about 80 to 90 percent. So I would say that if there's a number that you should walk away from in terms of relief of abdominal pain, it's about 80 percent. These operations all, whether it's a Whipple or a sparing head resection, all relieve abdominal pain about 80 to 90 percent. Now, we've compared uh, in our own series at Cincinnati uh, our experience with Whipples versus duodenal sparing head resection. We compared 59 patients who underwent a Whipple to 22 who underwent a duodenal sparing head resection. And these patients were equally matched in terms of history of symptoms, uh, use of preoperative narcotics, and anatomy uh, the patients had prior to surgical intervention. We demonstrated no difference in morbidity, mortality, or post-operative complications of delayed gastric emptying, wound infection, pancreatic fistulas, but did demonstrate that patients undergoing a duodenal sparing head resection had significantly decreased operative time and blood loss. And based upon this data, we preferentially perform duodenal sparing head resections as a treatment of choice for head predominant chronic pancreatitis. Now, there's a subset of patients where the operation is not clear. So there's a patient who has what we call small duct or minimal change disease where the entire gland is diseased. Then there are patients who have a genetic syndrome causing pancreatitis, like having a PRSS cationic trypsinogen gene mutation or a SPINK mutation or CFTR mutation, or people who've had prior operations have had a benefit and then have recurrent abdominal pain, so people who failed prior surgery. So for these operations, we perform a total pancreatectomy and islet oral transplantation, and we performed or presented our first paper in 2003 with our first 22 patients and demonstrated a 41% insulin independence rate and an 82% narcotic independence rate and improvement in quality of life. We've subsequently looked at our long-term experience. This is a study that was presented at the American Surgical a few years back of over 200 patients, all more than five years out from the surgery. And um, in this study, we demonstrated that uh, after five years, about 30% of patients remain insulin independent. Additional uh, 30 to 35% required less than 20 units of insulin. Uh, of those patients more than five years out, 75% um, um, remained narcotic independent, and you can see stable endocrine function long-term uh, more than five years out. So at one year, 38% uh, of patients were insulin dependent. This decreased to 27% in five years, but insulin requirement, as seen on the graph on the left, did not increase during this time, and C peptide function remained stable during this time. So in our own personal experience, uh, a one-year survival with this operation is 98.2%, five-year survival of 95%. Um, our longest follow-up is 14 years. Uh, our longest insulin-independent patient is 15 years, demonstrating uh, active C-peptide function at that time and uh, hemoglobin A1C that's controlled. Um, we have uh, low incidence of any diabetic complications, including uh, only one patient requiring uh, developing diabetic neuropathy, and uh, only two patients went on to receive a whole organ pancreas transplant related to diabetic complications. So this is an algorithm that we utilize uh, in managing these patients. So really, we try to determine if someone has a large duct or small duct disease, whether it's head predominant or not, and based upon that, determine the parenchymal and ductal anatomy and tailor the operation for that patient. Thank you.